The only freedom which deserves the name is that of pursuing our own good in our own way, so long as we do not attempt to deprive others of theirs or impede their efforts to obtain it. And this week's opening quote comes from John Stuart Mill. Welcome to Surviving the Matrix, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maxwell Egan. It's a pleasure to be with you once again, and I'll be your host for the next hour. I've been attempting to bring you an interview with Ray Broomhall for the last couple of weeks, and I managed to get this interview actually recorded this week, and it's quite a long interview, folks, so I'm just going to leave the intro right here, and I'm going to jump straight into the interview. This interview with Barrister Ray Broomhall was recorded last Tuesday, the 21st of May, and we were discussing 5G action on the ground and what action people could take against the 5G rollout that is happening around the world. So please enjoy. So Ray Broomhall, welcome to the show, brother. Good to have you here. Thanks for having me, Max. It's great to be with you, mate. So you've uh, sort of made a bit of a name for yourself lately, a bit of a household name around the area here with your action you've taken against 5G, which is, is really good to hear. And it's just, it's really good to see someone of your calibre actually taking a stand for this. So how did you sort of find out about this? How did you start on this this 5G activism that you're, that you're conducting at the moment? Wow, that's a good that's a good question. Probably started about six years ago with um, a client of mine. She came in and uh, from disability services, and she had a. They said that she was allergic to the twentieth century, and uh, she was uh, trying to stop a Telstra tower from being built. Uh, sorry, an MBN tower being built next to her uh, her home, and um, she lived out in the bush, and she had a chemical free home, and she was. Uh, uh, very concerned that she had that she was allergic to electromagnetic radiation, and uh, I thought nothing of it. I thought, what's this? This is a bit strange. But being the person I am, I looked very carefully into it and uh, managed to find a credible doctor that could uh, assess her. And the doctor assessed her, and uh, lo and behold, she had EHS, commonly known as electromagnetic hypersensitivity syndrome, and it went from there, and it's become absolutely massive to this day. I didn't realise how many people out there actually um, are either sensitive to electromagnetic radiation or are extremely concerned about it. And you've, you've got this pretty unique approach you've been taking to stop these 5G mm-hmm. towers, like using doctor's reports and the legal system, mm-hmm. you know, the, the basic criminal code of each state. Can you run through yes. us what, what this action is and how you, how you got onto that, how that, how that came about? Okay, well, how it all started was um, I originally uh, tried to get what's called an injunction, which is to stop the telco from emitting uh, radiation through the Supreme Court. And it was basically an injunction, which basically meant that we were afraid of harm to this particular client. We went through the Supreme Court process. The problem there was is that we had to come up with security of costs. But without sort of confusing your listeners, um, the security cost means that if we won an injunction, which basically means to restrain them from emitting, then by the time um, they could appeal it, there was a that gap. They wanted security for costs, which basically meant that uh, if they won the appeal and they could start again, uh, that we would have to cover them for any money that they lost during that period of restraint. And unfortunately, uh, my little client, who was uh, a dis- disabled pensioner, um, fighting against a huge telco, um, we're talking millions of dollars, uh, possibly that that she had to come up with, and we just couldn't. She just couldn't come up with the money, so I didn't give up on her. And I thought, well, how's another way of getting a restraint without actually having to go through the Supreme Court? And that's when I realised that there was another avenue, which was to go through the lower courts, which was the magistrates' courts, and go through a, a, a certain process of using the criminal code. Uh, to assist and the best way to explain is we have in uh, in Tasmania we have uh, various um, peace and good behavior type arrangements in some states it's called an apprehended violence order in some states it's called a peace and good behavior order um, protection order and the best way to explain is if your neighbor or somebody who um, is out there trying to um, that you believe and you have a reasonable fear that they're going to harm you in some way uh, then you can actually apply to have a restraint order put against them under the criminal code, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah keep, keep so, going. Yeah, so how, how that works is that basically with a – how I found it found out was that basically under 
pretty much anywhere you have what we call assault. And I had to prove to the court, in essence, that there was an assault being taken place against my client. And the way I did it was I basically looked at the criminal code and assault has a certain uh, prerequisite um, as to what an assault actually is. And the best way to explain it is an assault is basically anybody that, um, without that person's consent, applies force, either directly or indirectly, to the other person, um, and it sort of constitutes some sort of harm in some way, it constitutes an assault. Now, the provisions make it very clear that assault can be also given in regards to when they talk about applied force, can be in the form of light, heat, or electrical energy which clearly uh, electromagnetic radiation encompasses that. So basically what you have here is you have uh, the emitters, as I like to call them, who their sole purpose in life is to build a tower or to build some device, and its whole purpose is to irradiate electromagnetic radiation into the environs. Now, how the law works is this, is that if I've been um, living in my own home, and my neighbour decides to irradiate electromagnetic radiation from over their property into my property, well then, and that's against my consent, I don't want it to occur, then I can apply for a restraint order to stop them. And the basis that's behind the restraint order is what we call a threat to assault. So in essence, when somebody uh, threatens to assault me with electromagnetic radiation, I can then simply um, go to the courts, in essence, um, and apply for a restraint order against them. Now, the most important thing when this is going on is that you have to, when you go to the court, you have to have it substantial evidence and you have to have developed a reasonable fear that this thing is going to harm you. Now, you could go up and say, well, look, I've looked at the internet and uh, I've uh, looked at various studies, etc., and those studies tell me that it's dangerous. That's not going to cut, cut the mustard, so to speak. You need to get what we call substantial evidence or expert evidence, and the trick is to go and see a doctor. And if the doctor believes that you do have, uh, you are sensitive to this, uh, this stuff or that in their opinion that you, any, um, that you are at risk of harm of being in, in front of this, uh, this stuff or being exposed to this stuff, electromagnetic radiation, then you can actually apply that. You have that report, you attach that report to your application and you can go for a restraint order. And that's how it works. Yeah, so this is different to what some people... See, I, I've mentioned this on air and some people said, oh, look, <laughs> you can't do this because... Um, yeah, they'll put you in. I'll put you in a nut house for whatever, you know. And and they're they're saying to me, oh, there was a woman who went to a doctor and said, look, I've got all this this stuff from this electromagnetic radiation. I need you to give me a doctor's certificate so I can take it to the courts. This is completely the wrong approach, isn't it? Because you're making a claim, and therefore you've got to back up. You've got to provide medical evidence or expert evidence to back up that claim that you've made. You're no. doing the other approach, aren't yeah. you? You're just going basically going to the doctor and saying, look, does electromagnetic radiation cause harm and they will basically identify that it does and it's a, it's a different approach that you're taking isn't it because you're not actually making the claim you're just getting expert evidence on what electromagnetic radiation does yeah so what, what i'm doing is i'm removing all the science behind it um are you still there yeah 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 sorry it looked like a yeah so basically what you're doing is you're removing the um the science behind it so all i'm doing is my client has to or my clients all they need to do is establish that they have formed a reasonable belief that the emissions is going to harm them. And however they come up with that reasonable belief, and, and the courts will, will see reasonable belief as coming from a doctor, the doctor says, hey, this thing's going to harm you in their opinion, or you, you're at a risk of harm if they propose to it to install this thing or whatever, then uh, you can use that. Mm. So what a lot of people are saying, well, where are you going to find a doctor that will do this sort of thing? Where are you, where are you going to find a doctor that will sign these forms for you? <laughs> well, that's really interesting because there are doctors out there and, and that they're out there. You just go out and go and have a talk to your doctor and you say, excuse me, doctor, um, I have uh, I believe that this thing is going to harm me or I'm, I'm concerned about this, uh, this tower next to me or whatever it might be. And ask the doctor to say, look, can you please look at the science? Can you please tell me whether or not this is safe or not? Now, if the doctor comes to the opinion that it's uh, looked at the science and says, well, I've considered that uh, looking at the science that uh, there are studies out there that indicate that it is unsafe, 
And then when they apply what's known as the precautionary principle, which basically means that uh, if there's any uncertainty um, as to scientific um, certainty in regards to uh, emissions of electromagnetic radiation, then the precautionary approach must apply, which means that you must use precaution. And therefore, if there's a risk, then you work, you advise on that risk. Yeah, great. So that's a different, that's a completely different approach to going in there and making the claim. We just wanted to try to clarify that yes, for, yes, for people. Yes, it's, it's not a claim. It's you're, you're, you're concerned that they're threatening to assault you and uh, based on your fear from a doctor. Yeah. If that sense, your fear has been, has been substantiated and it's a reasonable fear with the, the common person that if anybody comes up and gets a, an opinion from a doctor and the doctor says that this is not good for your health, it's going to harm you, then you have a what we call substantive evidence enough to be able to um, to start some sort of action uh, in the courts, particularly in a restraint application type arrangement, which we've already done. We've, we've gone through that process. Where, whereabouts have you had success with this approach uh, here in Australia? Well, oh gosh, where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere. That's um, a great. That's a great answer to, to begin with. I'll tell you. Well, what's happened is it's got to the point now. Because <coughs> you, ha you have actually succeeded in stopping the rollout, or at least putting a huge spanner in the works in uh, in many places, haven't you? Oh, very much so. Um, it's uh, it took a while for to develop this, and uh, it got to the point where. All right, I'll explain it. The, how it all started was I I put together a my uh, what we call a peace and good behaviour order application against a. A couple of uh, very major telcos who were proposing to put a tower right next to this particular person's home, and it was right next to a school, I might add. So, in essence, what happened there is we we uh, put together a uh, an advice, and I also put down together what's called a complaint and summons type arrangement. I then got a silk, which is a senior counsel or QC, as some people call it, to settle it to see if it was okay, and then we got a retired uh, Supreme Court justice. To actually look at the look at the application and see if he thought that uh, this was uh, suitable to put, put before the courts, and he said yes. If it was put before him, if it, once he if he was the judge, he would have approved it. So that's how we started. And then we uh, basically what I did was I um, got the um, it was then put before a justice of the peace, and the justice of peace had to look at all the evidence, and the justice of peace before. Um, it was even placed in court, had to work out whether or not there should be a summons issued against the telcos. And the Justice of the Peace agreed and basically said, right, and summons these people to appear before court and the corporations. And that's exactly what happened. Okay? Excellent. So so that's, that's, that's what happened there. Now, there was another one, which is uh, Wilson's Creek, you've probably heard of, where there was a um, an application development which was made um, by a telco. Um, I won't mention their name, but the, the telco uh, was a huge tower. Uh, we rallied up the, um, worked out the precaution principle for them, uh, explained the assault principle process, etc. But the main thing was working on the precaution principle where we used doctor certificates, etc., to back up that, they, that the people had a reasonable fear. They armed counsel with the correct decision tools. So in essence, the trick is, is that whenever you complain to a council or to your local government in regards to a, a development application of some sort, you need to be armed, you need to arm that council with substantial evidence. Now, you can't just go up to a council and say, in my opinion, you know, blah blah blah, this is not not it's not safe. I've looked at the internet. That is not substantive evidence. And what will happen, unfortunately, is that the um, the telco will simply, if the council rejects their development application, the council will simply turn around and appeal the decision and say that the decision that council made was not backed up by substantial evidence or expert evidence. So to fill that gap, that's exactly what I do. I got the uh, people at Wilson's Creek, the community there, to have their um, their concerns backed up, their reasonable fears backed up by uh, medical evidence. And that's exactly what happened. We submitted that to council. I then explained the um, the implications in regards to the precautionary principle to the council. There was a bit of lobbying done behind the scenes, but in end, the council completely rejected the uh, the development application. And the actual telco realised they were they were they were in for a big fight, and they decided and made it very public that they were not going to appeal the decision that council had made. So that's when I realised that we we're on a on a winner here. I then did the same thing with a very big development. 
um, which was I had about 30 different uh, groups in Australia who were f fighting a 5G uh, scenario. Um, in each, and this was in New South Wales, Victoria, and Queensland. Now, we're talking about 900 already established and installed uh, 5G um, small cell facilities. There was also a proposed to propose an, an extra 1,600 were, for, were proposed as well. So all up, we're looking at 2,500 small cell facilities. So I used the same approach, the same assault issue, the same um, precautionary principle issues, the same environmental issues, and the, the risk to public health, and used all that, backed up with doctor's evidence, and basically um, lobbied the councils. The councils then realised that they could do something and make a decision on it. And what happened, in effect, was that the councillors uh, then elect... We also got the federal member of parliament in the, into a meeting. I turned up to the meeting, and I'm going to explain this to you. My clients, how it all started is I picked on one particular street, one, one community. There were eight doctors in the street and, and uh, three, I think it was three lawyers, and they engaged me to stop the tower, the, the small cell facility being placed in front of, in their street. And it's interesting, when these things are placed in doctors' backyards, they get very narky about it, <laughs> and uh, as you can understand. Now, so here I had... Eight doctors, all specialists in their fields, because we're talking about a very, very wealthy suburb here. Um, I then turned up at, to, at a, a community consultation meeting, which was put on by this uh, particular telco. Turned up there with all my doctors, and also some other doctors turned up, and I had my specialist doctor, who also turned up, who had given the advice to the doctors that it was going to uh, a risk to their health. The other side had their own specialist um, who wasn't a medical doctor but a, some sort of scientist, and um, it was great. We uh, basically explained everything. We served documents on various people, etc. They were put on notice that it was going to harm, and in the end, all we wanted was them to move the, the five cell, small cell facility somewhere else. The council, we then lobbied the council and told them, look, make a make some sort of suggestion to the federal government that they put a, a moratorium on the um, on the uh, approach of, on allowing this 5G small cell facility to go ahead. Um, that's exactly what council did. They um, basically put, even though this this thing had no development applications whatsoever involved, this was purely a consultation meeting for the community. No development application. It was a fait accompli that the uh, telco could uh, put the or the network could put the actual five the five G uh, in the in on there without the government regulation said you could do it etc. But I knew that the tool was was to convince council on public health grounds that this thing needed to be removed, and that's exactly what happened. And what they did was that it was a beautiful thing. They they um, they raised it, passed the resolution. Um, in effect, what it did was that we got an announcement not long after that that uh, the whole network decided to shut down and so, in a sense, they closed down 900 small cell facilities and 1,600 proposed small cell facilities, all based on the council's rejection of the development, so to speak. Fantastic it was great stuff. So, but they're still mm. trying to push this throughout Australia. I mean, we're still hearing a lot yes, from I the government about pushing 5G. Yes. So uh, it's uh, it's interesting how they're really still trying to go with this. This this works in Australia using the Australian Criminal Code and possibly yes. would work in New Zealand. I would say possibly even in Canada you would be able to use this approach. Um, I wouldn't. I can't see why not. I think it can be used pretty much in any um, <coughs> in any uh, situation where assault is a crime. And uh, yes, you can do that. And the precautionary principle usually applies. Pretty much in most legislation, um, you'll find that in all legislation, particularly in Australia, uh, the precautionary principle is sort of embedded in most legislation you'll find. Um, I've seen it in, I know in the United States, for example, they've got the Section 704 issue that they've got with the Telecommunications Act. And I've had a look at that very carefully, and I believe that it will work there too. Well, that's good because that was going to be my next question because a lot of the audience listener base is in the United States and they're, they're really pushing this in the United States. Trump is really pushing 5G, saying we want to be first and all this sort of stuff. And a lot of people in the United States are wondering if there's some method that they can do this in their own country. Of course, you'd have to do it state by state. 
look at what the criminal code is in your state. And uh, yes. but what you're saying about the uh, about assault and the precautionary principle, this makes a lot of sense, and it has to be. There has to be something yeah. like this in there, surely. Yeah. Well. Well, it's a long line. It's it's how I can explain it to you. This the federal government in in Australia and anywhere else cannot legislate. It, if they go against the criminal code, then they're all liable. Okay. So whoever approves a – if they're aware that this thing's going to harm someone and then they approve it and you're in fear that it's going to assault you, then they become party to that assault. Does that make sense? Yeah, whoever, yeah absolutely. Whoever, whoever might be involved in it doesn't – just because you're in a certain position or whatever, it, it, you still invoke criminal liability. That's yeah. the beauty of it. Mm. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. People who are having difficulty finding doctors and finding people who will write these reports out for them, it's, it's very important that they maintain the correct approach in approaching these doctors, isn't it? Because yes. it's like you say, going in there and making claims, it can cause all sorts of problems. But you've, well, you've really got to have the right approach and just get these people to identify whether or not electromagnetic radiation causes harm, really. That's that's basically what you're after. You're not making any claims, well, well, claiming there's any course. damage being done to you or anything like that, are you? No, no, what you're asking is, you're asking, is it a, would you consider this, this tower or this facility or whatever it might be, I'm asking for your opinion, Doctor, would you consider it safe? Hmm. I'm not asking that whether it's going to harm me or not. I just want your opinion. Is it safe? Hmm. I want the science... And I want you to look at various things. Now, I suggest there's a few things you can ask your doctor to do. And first of all is to have, get your doctors to have a look at the bioinitiative uh, report. And you can get that at HTPS um, semicolon backslash backslash bioinitiative.org and have a look at the um, and, and have a look at that. The other thing is there's a, a, a beautiful link called the uh, Physicians for Safe Technology. 5G mobile communications, and it's uh, HTPS semicolon backslash backslash mdsafe.org. And that is pretty much all doctors around the world who have got together and uh, talking about this thing and how unsafe it is. And uh, all you need to do is, is really, in essence, go and see a doctor. And if the doctor can't assist, then you can ask them to refer you to someone else. Now, I've got, obviously... Uh, specialists that that can refer it, and I actually have specialists who, who are actually appeared in court, and and one of them is uh, probably the leading expert in Australia, who was in a, a a very leading case which was called McDonald and Comcare, and in that case, uh, that particular doctor, um, um, the it was the first case of EHS in Australia where it was in essence sort of recognised as an ailment. And uh, it all—it was all based on whether or not that particular person had a had a reasonable fear that uh, the electromagnetic radiation around that person um, was causing their their issues, and that's that's what it was. And I used that particular doctor, um, particularly as a specialist doctor for court cases. Are there resources? Do you have a website where these resources and links are available? If anyone's listening to this on YouTube, by the way, I will put these links in the description below the clip. But uh, do you have a website with any resources? Or I imagine you're getting a huge amount of emails at the moment and approaches oh, from people I'm as well. So, Yes, I'm absolutely flat out. I think I didn't realise... I knew it was big in Australia, but I'm starting to get a lot of emails over the across throughout the world as to how I can assist, and uh, I'm doing my best to try and answer as many as I can. I'm trying to. I've got so many interviews with people; it's not funny. Um, I tried to keep your name out of it, to be honest. I tried to not <laughs> let on what your name was when people approached me. I kind of approached you first and said, hey, look, can I, can I send this guy your email? But uh, I realised it didn't matter. I started seeing well, that you were appearing everywhere and every, you, the cat was out of the bag. So you've really, yes. uh, you've really put your head up for this one, right? There's a, a few you're million not, people that would like your services at the moment. Well, if everyone could just bear with me, I'm putting a site together which I'm giving um, basically a step-by-step -step guide as to what you need to do in order to develop your evidence, in order to get your attorney or your lawyer um, backed up and ready to, to start the process. So the real key and the real crux to this is that you need to get evidence, okay, um, before you start anywhere. 
and um, I can go through some of the steps if you like. Well, that'd be, that'd uh, be good. But, but it's uh, it's I really do recommend you put a website together so there's a resource yeah. there so people can just go there. Otherwise, you are just going to get inundated with so much email. You probably will even from this show. I have quite a large listener base, so. Just, just yeah, try to bear with Ray, folks. Don't send you too many emails. Wait till he gets his website open. But listen, we're going to have to shoot off for a break now because we've reached that mm-hmm. time. So thank you for joining me on the show today, folks. It's always a pleasure to have your company. I'm here talking with Ray Broomhall, and we'll be back to speak to you again in a few minutes. Thanks for listening. And welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here with Ray Broomhall. We're talking about 5G. And Ray's just going to run us through some of the steps that he's got outlined for people to be able to take this action on in their home turf. So I leave it with you, Ray. Open up the floor, brother. Thank you. Now, just to make sure that everyone, before everyone sort of takes action on this or does anything, that they should always seek legal advice on it before they go any further. But uh, so I'm really just sort of giving a bit of a sample as to how what I what I require personally. So, so first of all, you've got to identify the source of the EMR emissions. I call it EMR as in electromagnetic radiation, or the proposed emissions. And if it's a tower. Um, or a mobile base station or a 5G small cell or a smart meter, a Wi-Fi router, or even your neighbour's got a, uh, a baby monitor, for example, you just got to find out where is the source coming from. Second, identify the site where the emissions or proposed uh, emissions will be rated, uh, radiated from. For example, it could be your home, it could be the workplace, the school, hospital, retirement home, public transport, etc. So, So this is the second step, just work out that. Third step is to measure the, and record the distance between you and the EMR emission device or facility. Okay. Four, identify the emitter or the proposed emitter, the installer, the public relations company behind it, your local council, and very important, the landowner who actually owns the land. Is it your neighbour or is it someone else? The names of involved corporations. So if there's a corporation that's uh, behind the facility, their respective uh, company numbers, if they've got an ABN number or an ACN number, for example, in Australia, we use that. Now, what's really important, too, is also include the names of the directors of such corporations because they're, they're personally liable in some cases as well. So that's that's really important. Now, in Australia, you can identify and find your, your mobile communications tower if it happens to be like a... Uh, a small cell facility that's been put in the power pole in front of your home or it was a huge tower, you can go on what's known as the RFNSA site. It's a website, and I'll just read it out to you. It's HTPS semicolon backslash backslash www.rfnsa.com.au. And all you've got to do there is type in your suburb, you identify the tower that's near you, click on it, and what you need to do is retrieve what's called the EME report, and the compliance certificate. And that will sort of explain and show you a lot of what the radiation and what's what's expected from that particular tower. If it's an existing uh, installation, so you've got to look at that and work out, is it an existing installation? It's already there. And if yes, then most likely it's already been approved by council or in the alternative, it did not require development approval. So just contact your local council uh, to confirm that. Is it a proposed installation? Does it require development approval? So you contact your council, and if development approval is required, ask the council for the expiry date that any objection submissions are to be submitted by. Okay, so you can get you can address that very quickly. And then sometimes the emitter or the proposed emitter will advertise to the public requesting submissions inclusive of deadlines concerning their installation as part as part of an industry public consultation process. What you need to do is verify whether their consultation process forms part of a legitimate council development application or not, because uh, a lot of the times they'll do that, um, even though they don't have to um, do a full-on development application. So just check to see what that's going on there. Now, if the emitter or the proposed emitter has been in contact with you via a letter or a notice or what you've got to do is collate all the correspondence, including every, any correspondence that you may have sent to the emitter. So it's very, very important that your lawyer gets hold of that sort of information. And then, as I said before, is then to obtain a medical opinion uh, as to whether or not the EMR emissions or the proposed emissions are or could pose a risk of harm to your health. 
If risk of harm uh, to health is advised, then request that the medical practitioner advise on recommendations as to what needs to be done to remedy the situation. So examples of recommendations might be that you are not exposed to EMR emissions from the tower or the device, uh, to use cable uh, instead of Wi-Fi, turn routers off, etc. To assist, you may wish to provide your medical practitioner with a link to the Buy Initiative Report 2012, which has been updated since 2017. Um, and then you, um, you also then ask, you could refer them to what I said earlier, which was the Positions for Safe Technology, 5G Mobile Communications, to have a chat to them about that and explain that. that. So basically asking them to look at the science. Um, if the emissions uh, or the, the pr proposed emissions are from an existing ex uh, installation, the trick is, is to obtain witnesses who have mobile cell or internet coverage, i.e., for example, when they visit your home, do the witnesses have re reception from their carrier? If yes, reception indicates that your home is being irradiated by that by their particular carrier. Do you understand that, mm -hmm. uh, Matt? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, then, so witnesses can then swear or affirm their testimony as evidence uh, in an affidavit. So, so see a lawyer for assistance on drafting an affidavit to to raise that. Well, yeah, this is what I ask my, my clients yeah, that's, to do. A, that's a pretty sneaky way around it, isn't it? Just just getting your friends, hey, are you you receiving a signal from your carrier because it's not my carrier? And that's so therefore correct. my so, home yeah. is being irradiated by your carrier and I didn't ask for that. That's a, that's a pretty good one. I like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're not you're not actually doing it yourself because if you go and get it, then you're sort of almost acquiescing that. Oh, yeah, I've, um, you know, you, you've got to get the evidence from someone else that's visited your home, had a look at the their phone, and they've got bars on their phone. That's all you need to to show that you're being irradiated by electromagnetic radiation onto your property. Okay. That's a that's a great little that that's a great approach. I really like. I don't, that. I don't need I don't need a um, all this. Cubuncle science or anything out there to prove that there is a, a radiation occurring on my property. The reasonable person, a judge would be a reasonable person, would look at that and go, well, clearly this person's getting reception on their phone. Well, clearly they're being irradiated by that carrier. Hmm. So, mm. I that like makes it. Sense? That, that, <laughs> okay, that, that's you. a great approach. <laughs> um, so then the next step would be to contact a building biologist, um, if, you, if you want to, to conduct a report as to the EMR emissions in your home. So that will be like a, you know, just to find out what's actually on in your property. Now, you could do this before uh, development or be uh, before an installation or after an installation, but it's usually best to get something like that. Now, the other one is to obtain quotes for shielding purposes, such as shielding mesh, cloth, shielding paint, etc., to shield not only your purse and your house, but include, include the land as well. So, you know, you want to go out and hang, uh, you're washing out on your clothes on, you want to play with the children out in the backyard. Well, you don't only need shielding in your, inside your home, you need it on the outside of your home. And a building biologist should be able to uh, assist you in that regard because what that does is, in essence, uh, that's your, that's basically what we call a compensation claim that you're developing there. Does that make sense, Matt? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Then if you have the funds... You could also uh, obtain an independent radiation dissimetry report as to radiation levels emitted from uh, whatever the device might be or the facility and do what we call specific absorption rate levels in uh, entering yours or your kids' or your family's bodies. And uh, that I can assist on pointing you in the right direction there. In fact, uh, we've, uh, we've got together some really interesting uh, measurement devices now that uh, uh, we've realised that... Um, I'll explain it shortly, but basically we've got ones that can measure between the 1 hertz to 400 kilohertz, which is a Nadia exposure level tester, which is an ELT 400. And then we go up to the 75 megahertz to 3 gigahertz range, which is a 3AX75M-3G. It's another uh, testing device. And then we can also go up to the 100 kilohertz to 3 gigahertz. And I've got specialists that can do that in an independent basis to actually measure these towers to make sure that they're complying because, unfortunately, you'll find that industry is self-regulated. There's no real police officers out there or policemen uh, checking these towers to see what's really coming off those things. So when they know that we are actually got specialists that can go out and test and calibrate what's going, really coming from these towers, you'll find that they back down very quickly. Okay. 
Um, the other thing is uh, collate all those documents that I just said and forward the copies to your to your lawyer or your attorney. Okay, it's as simple as that. Now, what you then need is basically a to instruct your lawyer or attorney to draft an advice for you based on, on the doctor's opinion and everything else that's been provided to the lawyer. And then the, the what happens there is that that lawyer or the attorney will then give uh, legal remedy and options in regards to either restraint orders, etc., uh, the assault provisions, precautionary principle, uh, how it works on the environment, various ver environmental acts. You'll find that electromagnetic radiation, particularly in Tasmania, where I'm from, and in most states in Australia, electromagnetic radiation is classed as a pollutant under most environmental pollution control acts. And, uh, or a contaminant. So in essence, your neighbour or your whoever is uh, emitting these electromagnetic radiation is in fact contaminating your property. And uh, so you need to get some, some general advice as to where that goes, okay? And basically, it's very, very important that um, uh, health risks associated with, with EMR, though not fully established scientific, scientifically at present, would still require precautionary measures, measures to be taken by an admitter and governmental decision makers. Very, very important. Now, if an admitter or a government uh, decision maker disregard health risks when making a decision to admit or allow others to admit EMR into a person, particularly when they've been put on notice uh, of harm, by or a risk of harm by a medical practitioner, then those parties might be liable in either the civil or criminal jurisdiction or both. OK. Um, and as I said, there's various options that might be available, such as restraint orders, abatement notices. You can actually get your counsel to issue an abatement notice against the emitter that it's a potential risk to health or it's a currently is a risk to health. Uh, you can do personal injury claims um, based on some of that. You can also go through nuisance claims environmental nuisance and, and various criminal charges and assault is only one of them there are so many provisions under particularly in tasmania uh and queensland and other states where the criminal code um really does apply in a lot of other areas of law so the things like using use of a dangerous weapon for example or dangerous uh thing um, there's all sorts of things, uh, aggravated assault, etc. If it's to exposure to a child, there's all sorts of things to, the criminal code applies. Um, once you had uh, legal advice, then what I would sort of recommend is send the advice and the substantial evidence that you've put together to your um, to the emitter, so whoever the telco is, and also to all, all parties. So uh, it'll be like it could be if it's the emitter, you go to the um, uh, you'd send it to the directors of the of the corporation, and let's. I'll just tell you now, corporations are not exempt from criminal uh, uh, liability, uh, so they are they can be criminal liable. Um, are you still there, Max? Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. When you're when you're yes, referring sorry. to the emitter, you're referring to the company. I just want to clarify this for people as well. People, it's, well, it's well, not the tower he's <laughs> referring to. It might be Telstra or Optus or Vodafone or whoever's putting up the tower is the emitter. Correct. Well, it could be any. It could even be a neighbour with the. It could be a power company with a smart meter, for example. It could be anything. So you've got to work first of all identify who it is. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to explain. I, I explain this. The, the the simple principle behind this is this: when you uh, live in a home or you buy a home, you uh, you have what we call special specific rights to that home, and it's a very long and old law. And the old law is that you have the right to the quiet enjoyment of your property free from the interference of your neighbour, okay? Mm -hmm. So your neighbour, um, if, if the neighbour does anything to interfere with the quiet enjoyment of your property, such as things like just simply discomfort, for example, you can then go and seek restraint against that person, and that's all we're applying here, okay? So that's what a peace and good behaviour order does. It just keeps the peace, So, or uh, what we call an apprehended violence order or whatever. It's just to keep the peace from your neighbour so they're not... Uh, not uh, interfering with your quiet enjoyment. Now, I'm going to explain what that means. So let's say your neighbour, for example, um, has noise that's too loud and it comes across your fence and, you, and it really annoys you and interferes with you and it's causing you headaches and you're getting a little bit upset with it. We already have laws that stop that. So you'll go around, call the police, and the police will come around and stop them from uh, making too much noise. Well, noise is, in a sense, a, a bit of a... Uh, you could say it's electromagnetic uh, emission anyway. Um, the other, if it's coming from a, a radio or, a, or some sort of amplified device. 
But the other thing is, let's say your neighbour burns car tyres in the backyard and uh, there's smoke coming over the fence. Um, well, if they do it just as a one-off, it's not really a problem. But if they keep doing it 24 hours a day, it becomes a nuisance. And you can then apply to, uh, in the smaller courts, the lower courts, to, to apply for restraint. Well, the same thing can be said with electromagnetic radiation. If you've got your neighbour who's building a tower and the sole purpose for that for that per, that per, that uh, neighbour is to emit electromagnetic radiation from their property onto your property, um, you and it causes you discomfort, and the com- discomfort that we use in this case is fear because you've gone to your doctor, the doctor says, hey, look, um, I believe that this thing's a risk, to your, a risk of harm to your health. Um, you've then got uh, expert opinion. Your fear is rationalised. It's it's clear that that thing's going to, you know, I've got a reasonable fear this thing's going to harm me. That's a discomfort, and therefore I can apply for a restraint order under nuisance law. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It makes perfect sense. I've been kind of explaining this to people on this show, but it's great to hear it from uh, from your mouth. For people also listening out there, Ray is a, a barrister. Could you explain to people the difference between a lawyer and a barrister, please, Ray? Uh, well, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> um, the, the, there's uh, You've got a solicitor and a barrister. So um, uh, what a barrister is, it means that I work solely as a barrister. I am a bit of a specialist. A bit, uh, the best way to explain it would be a bit like a – a specialist um, in the medical profession. You've got your people that specialise in um, um, medical profession, like might be a surgeon or whatever. I'm sort of that sort of in that sort of field in the in the legal world, if that makes sense. I get referred to by by solicitors. They they use my services, and I spend a lot of time looking at the real odd the odd uh, sort of cases, and I also look at um, trying to find a solution for for solicitors and also for clients. Um, and uh, we're advocates as well, so we're, we're very experienced at uh, delivering these things in court. And that's uh, You'll see the guys that wear the wigs and the gowns that you see on TV. They wear you know, a wig and a robe and a, and a funny-looking white tie thing. Uh, that's what I am. I'm a barrister. Yeah, no worries. I just wanted to clarify that for people because they may wonder what is the difference between a lawyer and a barrister and how does this all fit in. And So Ray's the sort of guy who, who gets in and looks at the nitty-gritty stuff and specialises in things. He's not just a guy who goes in there and argues in court. He's the people they. Mm. He's the sort of guy they refer to when, they, when they've got a problem. They'll call up someone like Ray and say, hey, figure this detail out for me. And Ray's got the, the, yeah. the nous and the intellect to go and do that, and probably the book yeah. collection as well. Yeah, yeah you find uh, I my, my clients are not you – know, I also get instructed by a lot of solicitors, so a lot of lawyers who have uh, – and this is where it comes into it. So let's say you went and saw your local solicitor, for example, or your attorney. Um, you go and have a chat to them, and they say, all right, well, there's a specialist uh, guy that uh, specialises in this field. Uh, well, he's a barrister. We'll get uh, Ray to uh, to assist, or it could be another barrister, but that's, that's how it works, yes. Cool. So yeah. which uh, what communities are you working with at the moment in Australia? You've done you've done one in Sydney, I believe. You've done one near here near Wilson's Creek, one in South Australia, I think. Oh, um, I've got – I've done – I haven't just done uh, – Wils- I've got <laughs> crikey. I've got hundreds of clients. Uh, I'm not joking. All, all revolved got, all revolved around this whole five G thing. Yes. Yes. Amazing. And this is all just since you started taking this action and making your, your face a little bit public. You, I can't imagine the amount of emails you must be getting at the moment. I. It's got to the point where it's. Uh, and please, please, people, please forgive me. I try as hard as I can to answer. I've got my PAs working on it uh, to try and answer the the bulk of the emails. Uh, and I think, like, going through this process with, with, with yourself, hopefully there'll be other lawyers out there will start taking this on board. And, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I'm really the only one. Um, I've got uh, – uh, I have educated some people. I've got um, um, a QC or an SC who's assisting me. Um, I've also got uh, some very uh, capable lawyers who are assisting on class action issues. And I've also got uh, a bit of a team put together of lawyers who I'm – educating on the process so so it's slowly getting out uh we're at the precipice of the wave but um it once uh i guess the biggest thing is for public uh it's really an education program for the public to understand that this thing is actually quite dangerous and and harmful uh electromagnetic radiation is what i've started to realize uh i was a skeptic at the start but i'm certainly a convert now 
uh, looking at the, and it's not just, I mean, I've got a plethora of doctors that I've been dealing with. Um, probably got about 45 doctors so far that I deal with um, who have actually said that this thing's a risk to harm. Well, it um, is, and it's, it's actually a weapons system as well. I mean, I've, I've looked at so much stuff with 5G technology. If, if you look at DARPA non-lethal weapons yeah. systems, there's all sorts of stuff they can do with this, which is well, a whole other ballgame. This is a whole other rabbit hole to open up, not just <laughs> to deal with the standalone yeah. electromagnetic radiation that it's causing, but it is a really, really important issue, and it is so imperative that, that people get on board with this and realise what's happening to our communities. It really is. Well, I've had a I've had a, a two and a half hour uh, chat with Mark Steele from the UK, uh, who you're probably familiar with. Uh, he's the the weapons expert in regards to 5G, and uh, I was sort of uh, just having a little chat to about his uh, court appearance that he had the other day, and um, we had a bit of a chat, and uh, he came back and said, "Look, we won," <laughs> so I was very happy with that. Um, but uh, Mark is uh, is a is a very uh, talented man, and he's a very knowledgeable man, and. There's, uh, it's not just Mark. There are there are plenty of other uh, people out there and scientists, and it's just a matter of collating them all together and putting them together as to to fight this uh, this uh, this problem this uh, that we have. Mm. Well, very good on you, brother, for uh, for stepping up and, and wanting to do this. So, what sort of stuff you, you're going to be speaking uh, at a talk with me in Brisbane on the thirtieth? You're not going to be there in person, I don't think. Are you? Be via Skype, oh, I one. think. I think I'm doing one by Skype on the 30th of May, and yeah. then I'm also going to be attending in person one on the 7th of July. You were talking about the Brisbane, the Brisbane yeah, one, is the that? Brisbane one, yeah. yeah. One yeah. on the 7th I'm of being... July as well. Is that in Brisbane as well? I think I've been asked to do that as well. I haven't. haven't yeah, so, so I'll actually be in person on the 7th of July um, in Brisbane. I think it's called the uh, fight. I mean, I've got so many conferences I'm going to, it's not funny. Um, but uh, yes. So I, I believe I'm with you on that one, yes. Okay, well, I might be there on the 7th as well. That would yeah. be good. There's people in Darwin that are requesting your help as well. Any any talk about getting up to there? Yes, I've uh, they've already engaged me, so I'm up there to uh, to assist them in trying to stop uh, the smart city development in Darwin, yes. So, uh, I'm, yes. yes Excellent. So I am actually There's actually applications. I was looking. There's around about five or 600 applications for smart cities on the table at the moment in Australia. Uh, like through it's, Parramatta, little suburbs, you know, little individual cities within cities. There's about five, five or six hundred of these that are on the on the table at the moment. So this is another level of, of what 5G is going to do. When we look at um, the smart cities, we look at the social crediting system, the virtual fences, everything they're doing in China. This is uh, this is very very scary proposals that they're putting forth, and they'll need 5G to power all this as well. Plus, you know, when you look at it with 5G being a weapon system, it gives the potential to um, put active denial on anybody at any time if they want to. If they really want to um, bring these type of applications to it, the, the problem is that it's there. The potential is there that this whole 5G system was actually developed as a weapon system for the military, and the communication is, is actually the, the secondary use of it. It's, it's a very, well, very concerning matter. It is, and, and what, what I found is that, um, particularly with this, is that you'll find that 4G is merely an instrument in order for 5G to piggyback on. So you'll see a lot of uh, facilities being uh, talked about as being 4G. Well, in fact, they do have the facilities to, to piggyback 5G. And what I can explain to, to your listeners is that um, – most EME reports will say if they're talking about a 4G system or talk about utilising it, well, sometimes they call it an LT700. Now, an LT stands for long-term evolution in 4G technology, and the best way to explain it is that the Asia-Pacific telecommunity, which is called APT, band plan is a type of segmentation of the 698 to 806 megahertz band, usually referred to as the 700 megahertz band. Now... This was formalised in 2008 and 2010, so it's actually formulated at least, uh, what, 12 years ago. Now, so as long as people understand what this means, um, the megahertz, of, um, when you see something that uh, talks about hertz or megahertz, a hertz, if you look at uh, most of this, uh, there's, a, there's a study out by a guy that's called Dr. Bruce Hocking. 
Now, he was a, uh, a head, the chief medical officer for Telstra, which is one of our major telecommunications company here in Australia. And he did a, a basically t did a testing, um, basically tested around communications tower back in 1998, and he found a cancer cluster for childhood leukemia around these towers. Now, he did a follow-up study, and it was backed up again by his follow-up study. Now, in that study, he set the study at 50 to 60 hertz. Now, I'll explain this very simply, short, how this works, because there was also at the Raminsky uh, Institute study, which was done in Italy, and um, that's where they found, that was at the 50 to 60 hertz range as well, and they found that uh, there was a lot of issues in regards to, they, they basically formed the opinion that uh, from that study, they spent $25 million on that study. It went for over 15 years, and it, uh, they, they did it on the life cycle of 2,500 rats. Now, this Ramazzini Institute were the same ones that found out in the 1980s that um, um, benzene was a carcinogenic and it caused cancer, a rare form of cancer in humans. Well, the, uh, in rats at the time, and they everyone poo-pooed them in, in the, the 80s, but now it's very well established that benzene is, is, a, is, is quite carcinogenic. They did exactly the same study in regards to mobile phone use and electromagnetic radiation. They found that it does cause a rare type of swanoma of the heart and in the ear canal, and it also causes brain cancer. Now, the thing was that that was at 50 to uh, 60 hertz, now, everyone's going to, this is why I look at it, is that, and I'm going to read, this is from Dr. Bruce Hocking, and this is the ICNERP. Now, people have heard of the 2009 ICNERP standards, and it says this, that the induced in situ electric field is uh, to 0 0.1 volts per meter at 50 hertz is termed the basic restriction, which corresponds to an exposed field of one kilovolt MRMS termed the occupational reference level. The main acute health effects of 50 to 60 hertz electromagnetic fields are caused by the induction of voltage gradients, which may elicit an action potential and cause excitation of nerve, muscle and cardiac tissue. There is a very wide range in excitability of tissue ranging from alteration of synapse activity in the brain at 0.75 volts uh, per meter peak and stimulation of a 20, 20 UM dynamo uh, nerve at 6.1 volt per meter peak. Or at uh, at ten, uh, sorry, at 12 volts per meter, cardiac muscle. So cardiac tissue is excitable at relatively high exposure levels, which is 12 volts per meter peak. Now it may be stimulated to cause arrhythmias, uh, which may be life threatening. And this is the report from Dr. Dr. Bruce Hocking. And this requires emergency medical treatment. Now the other thing is, is that while the energy from EMF is not cumulative in the body, unlike a toxin such as lead, it is likely that the more prolonged or recurrent an overexposure, the more likely there are to be health effects. There is no specific test for EMF overexposure or the so-called EMF poisoning. Treatment is based on the symptoms and the findings on examinations. There is no antidote for EMF poisoning. If there has been an overexposure, this needs to be discussed with the patient and their concerns explored and persistent headaches and dicea may be treated with blah, blah, and goes on. Now, what I'm trying to say here is going back to the 50 to 60 hertz, 50 hertz, 50 hertz simply means in Australia uh, or equivalent in the USA is called 60 hertz. So in layman terms, if a person is exposed to a 50 hertz electric field, then that person would actually receive an electric shock 50 times per second within that 50 hertz field. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. However, most 4G at the moment will produce an electric field of 700 million hertz, which is an equivalent to 700 million shocks per second. Okay? Seven, seven, 700, that's what we call a megahertz. So a megahertz is a million hertz. Yeah, so right? you're getting these shocks so frequently you don't even know that you're getting it, but it just becomes your new reality. So what I'm trying to say is the Rosini Institute was based on 50 to, 50 to 60 hertz, not at 700 million hertz. Mm. Do you understand that? We're, and It's a lot, lot stronger than what uh, these studies were based on, mm. okay? Now, that was done over a decade ago. However, today the standard in which 4G is operating in Australia is between 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. What this means is that a proposed 4G facility or 5G will most, most probably operate between 2 
1,400 million hertz, which is 2 billion hertz, or 5,000 million hertz per second. Mm. Your body is, is basically exposed to electric shocks to 5,000 5, million hertz per second compared to, to the, uh, the studies that were based only on 50 hertz. Yeah, there's you know, not, there's yeah. no test to say it's safe. This is the problem. Yeah, it opens up a, a myriad of possibilities of what they can do with this when you factor in the fact that this is actually a weapon system. And we're electromagnetic beings, so this is pretty freaky stuff. We're going to have to pull the pin here, Ray, because we've run out of time. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, I mean, I could bigger. chat to you for another hour, but uh, unfortunately <laughs> the, the radio won't let me do that. So we're going to have to pull the pin here, and it's been great to have you on. I'll have to get you back on again soon. We'll find out how you're going with these studies. Hopefully you get this website up and running and we'll get some resources up there. We'll um, alleviate some of these emails that you're getting and we'll provide resources mm -hmm. for people. I will put all the links below to any of the stuff that Ray's mentioned on the show here, folks. Thanks for having me. Uh, well, thank, uh, thanks for having me on. Thanks. I'm used to doing <laughs> interviews, you see, and I'm used to interviewing people. But thank you for coming on, Ray. And uh, it's been great to chat to you, brother, and we'll do it again soon. And, and keep up the good work. And thank you, thank you, thank you for stepping up the way you have. You know, the, the problem people have with the legal system is that there just isn't usually anybody in there that's on our side and you've kind of you've kind of fixed that problem so thanks for coming to the party brother it's been an absolute pleasure max and thank you for the good work you're doing too my good man well thank you thank brother. you we'll talk to you soon thank you no worries. thank you bye-bye bye and that was the interview with ray broomhall i do hope you got something from that and you will find if you're watching this on youtube that there are links below for some of the sites that ray recommended Again, I'll be speaking in Brisbane at the Newnham Hotel on the 30th of May with Ray Broomhall and Natalie Vera and Paul Seals. If you're in Brisbane, please come along and check that out and I look forward to seeing you there. As always, I would like to send out a thank you to the many people who send me so many kind emails. I am getting through the emails, folks. You will get a reply eventually. And thank you, thank you to my Patreon supporters because I could not do any of this work were it not for the support you give me. But that is it for me, folks. I'm now completely out of time. I will look forward to speaking to you again next week. Please take very good care until then. In luck, Cash.